Hello and welcome to the Sanya Faruqi show. Today we have somebody joining us from Bangladesh, Tasafi Hussain. Tasafi Hussain is a development professional and an advocate for human and gender rights. She's the founder of Bonishika, Unlearned Gender, which works towards building a society where everyone is accepted, irrespective of their gender, main focus being providing equal choice and right to opportunities. In her feminist utopic world, Tasafi imagines a world without gender where what you look like like how you are treated and what role you play is not determined by the sex organ that you're born with. Every individual should be just another human being, not one specific identity that you're boxed into. Tasafe, a very warm welcome. It's wonderful to have you on the Sanya Faruqi show today. Hi, Sanya. Thank you so much for having me here. Awesome. Um, so as we begin, could you tell us a little uh, more about the work that you've been doing for the past, uh, you know, so many years, what led you to create an organization like Bonishika and uh, what were the issues that you decided to take up when you, you know, created this organization? Um, yeah, so I think it, the organization sort of took a life of its own and kind of got created in its way. I don't think that was the initial plan that we had in mind when we started out. Um, and when we started out, it was really just a thought that there needs to be more conversation about this. I think that's something we all feel growing up, even as young girls, when you start noticing um, little discrepancies um, in how you're treated as opposed to your brothers and other men and boys that you see around. Um, and I think that was kind of what started it going um, when I came back from university, actually quite a, a few years after I came back from university. Um, and we were just having a conversation about um, Valentine's Day and things uh, we did uh, back at university. And actually, one of the things we had was um, the vagina monologues, the play, uh, which, you know, showcases stories of women from around the world around different issues, starting from um very simple ideas of perception and what to do, what not to do, things like that, to violence, to sexuality. And um, we were just talking about this with some friends and the thought came that why not try that in Dhaka and see how that goes. Um, so I think that that's sort of just how it started. It wasn't intended and we didn't necessarily have any expectations of how exactly it would go. Um, but it was always a good conversation starter. So we thought, why not? Um, so back in 2010, that's what we started with. Um, and it was just word of mouth mostly that we promoted it. Uh, we weren't completely sure how um, the reaction to it would be. Um, but it was great. Like mostly people wanted to hear more about it. Um, so after we did like two very small shows, we had others who kept on asking us about it. So we actually ended up doing an impromptu larger show in an actual proper auditorium, um, which also sold out like within a week of us announcing it. So um, that kind of got things started. But even then, for a few years, we pretty much stuck with working on doing just the uh, vagina monologues a month, a year, that kind of a thing, two or three shows a year. Um, but as we started doing more of that, we also got to uh, get involved with other specific uh, feminist activities in the larger movement of Bangladesh. Um, and while we were doing that, more conversations started happening within our groups with others that we kept on meeting around experiences that we face as women here. Um, and even though the stories in Vagina Monologues, you could connect to them because even if the specific context might not be the same, the feeling of the experience is still the same. So you still do connect to it in certain ways. But we also felt we had our own stories and that kept on coming up um, when we were rehearsing, when we were sitting around chatting and things like that. And slowly we started kind of working on putting together our own pieces based on specific issues that we felt were very pertinent to our own experiences growing up, our own experiences as women, um, navigating different relationships um, and figuring out things for ourselves. 
Um, and once we started talking about women's issues, we also started talking about relationships between men and women, how that is forming. Um, and we actually had men also start coming up. And um, of course, they were volunteering, volunteering before anyway, with helping us organize events and things like that. But a lot of them also wanted to come and talk about their gender experiences. So that sort of also opened up the avenue for us to start talking about gender in a broader perspective, not just in terms of women's issues, but gender as a social construct and what that means for everyone growing up with these concepts and ideas and expectations. Um, so now we have quite a few people who work with us and we've been trying to talk around what it means to have these gendered expectations on ourselves, how it affects how we ourselves see ourselves, but also how it affects how we navigate relationships with each other. Um, and also talking about gender made us realize that we cannot just talk about gender and not talk about sexuality because they're very strongly connected and integrated, um, not just in terms of how we navigate relationships with ourselves, but also how we see ourselves, how we connect to our own bodies, how we understand our own sexuality. And there's so much shame and taboo around all of these topics that there aren't necessary spaces to have this conversation. So I think all of these sort of took on its own life and moved along into its own kind of creation as such. Um, and this is where we are now. So I just want to know, what does Bonishika mean? I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a um, Bangla word. And we actually um, took it as an inspiration from uh, one of Nozrul's songs, where um, the song title actually says, um, Jago Nari Jago Bonishika, which means um, women wake up and take space. Um, and Bonishika kind of means like a bonfire. So we thought fire is a good metaphor because it's both something that you can use to break down things, but also create something new. Okay, so that's really interesting, um, you know, the name and the whole meaning, you know, why, why that was selected. So um, coming to the social issues in Bangladesh, could you talk a little about that? For example, as we spoke, you've done a lot of work on gender, you've done a lot of work on LGBTQ rights as well, forced marriages, marital rape. Um, how are you as an activist dealing with these subjects? Is it difficult? Is it uh, challenging to cover these topics in Bangladesh? Yes, um, you know, like I was saying, um, talking about women's sexuality itself is still such a taboo topic here. Um, and we're just starting to have uh, conversations around marital rape. Um, it's only getting the momentum to try and um, legally uh, acknowledge marital rape as a crime. We, we don't have that um, uh, in Bangladeshi rape law yet. Um, so... So even having that conversation, it's quite difficult because um, one of the main things, you know, culturally, socially, in our patriarchal system, we've taken sexuality away from women. Um, so women's bodies are, and we see this also when we have workshops with women and trying to have these conversations with them. Um, you ask them about their bodies and what they see it for, how they connect to it. And a lot of the conversation is about um, the utility of the body. So how the body is required and used and very much, um, and the other side of the conversation would be about their body and, um, violence. Um, these are the two ways women tend to keep on connecting to their bodies. Um, so in some ways we've just taken an agency away from women, their own connection and, um, their own, yeah, ownership in a way of their bodies. Um, and women's bodies are basically there either for their children or for men, um, whether for men to enjoy it or for men to take advantage of it. Um, so even just trying to break down that conversation, trying to talk about women having ownership over their body, enjoying their body for themselves, thinking of their body as pleasurable for themselves. Just that conversation itself is difficult, both with men and women. Um, and whenever we do have women who are bringing up these topics, then the connotation of this being like, you know, a bad woman, that keeps on coming up as well. 
So that's just the socially acceptable way, the only way women who connect to their bodies or think of their bodies as pleasurable is that they're bad women. They're not acceptable women for our societies. And does religion play a role in that judge? judge Definitely. I think it's, 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 it's a mix of both, right? It's, it's a culturally acceptable form. So in a way, all our religions... Um, even all the religions um, within Bangladesh, um, all sort of add to that same um, storyline. Um, and of course, Islam, which is the majority religion here, definitely um, also supports the same storyline of women needing to cover themselves. So uh, whenever we are having anti-rape conversations, um, the role of women and how they're dressing keeps on coming up. Um, and we've had this come up a few times, even in the recent few months, because there's quite a strong anti-rape movement and campaign going on right now from women's uh, rights groups, from feminist groups here. And you look into social media and you'll keep on seeing this same conversation about uh, but what are women dressing as? When are they outside? Why are they outside? Um, do they need to be in the, those spaces? So again and again, we're still having these same conversations of why, what would be the responsibility of women to protect themselves. So recently, actually, um, one of the platforms that have come together mainly to work on anti-rape um, campaign and um, to sort of push for both legal and social changes. Um, it's called Feminists Across Generations. And within this platform, one of, the, one of the major messages being put out is that we as women do not want to be protected. We just want freedom. Because I think that's also a very cultural connotation that we have for the need to protect women. And whenever we talk about safety and security, again, the conversation ends up becoming about protecting them. Um, how do they learn to protect themselves? How do we as families protect themselves? How do we as men protect our women? And again, it goes back to those same same lines of protection that how do you keep, stay inside? What do you wear? Um, even self-defense comes up as conversation, but the conversation keeps on getting diverted to put the responsibility on women. Um, and we are really trying to push that the conversation has to turn the other way around. And people who rape, largely men who rape, are the ones who are raping women, have to be the focal point of the conversation. And the responsibility and the accountability has to be on them, including putting accountability on men to start having these conversations, um, to start pushing for these changes, to, you know, also sort of play the advocate and the ally where they're also saying that we cannot keep on saying women need to dress a certain way because men cannot control themselves. Like men need to be, need to, you know, have a strong voice and say, I can control myself. So why aren't you? Um, that also needs to be a big part of the conversation. So, yeah, I think, I think these are, um, it's changing. It's definitely difficult. Um, it does sometimes feel like, we keep on having the same conversations all the time, every every few years. It sort of feels like you're back to square one again. Um, but also at the same time, you do see more people talking about it, especially younger generations are a lot more vocal than maybe even like three, four years ago. And I think that's that, that shows change. That shows the promise that maybe things are changing. Yeah. So interestingly, uh, when you spoke about the men, uh, you know, uh, trying to become an equal voice when it comes to the, you know, status of uh, when women are getting raped, you started the How I Can Change uh, campaign in 2017, mm -hmm. right around the time when the Me Too campaign was going on. So could you talk a little about that? Like, uh, what was the response? Do you think as a society, is it just a selected few men who are coming out and speaking and joining forces or... Have we become such an inclusive society where we have both men and women talking about uh, Me Too with a voice that, you know, the way that you, uh, you know, spoke about how I can change uh, status? Yeah. Actually, when I wrote that um, and I put it up on my status, almost no men in my own uh, group of 
friends or, you know, acquaintances actually came up and put up anything. Like when I actually put up that writing and a lot of them came and said, oh, yeah, this makes sense and stuff like that. Um, and I actually, I think a few days later, I actually added a comment saying it's interesting when, because if you do read it and then you come to the conclusion of it, which ends with saying how I can change, it's also taking responsibility, right? And I think that was very much missing. Um, I didn't get the response I was hoping to. You, uh, I should have asked this earlier, but can you explain what how I can change status yeah. update for the campaign was? Yeah, so I think um, this started maybe two, three months after um, the Me Too campaign happened in um, 2017, October, I believe. Um, and I, uh, I think uh, in 2017, October, actually, I wrote a piece around um, this concept of the bad men, because once the once the campaign sort of started in Bangladesh and women were putting up their experiences, um, putting up their hashtags for me too. Um, I think one of the things that happened was I kept on seeing all these men who were either shocked or didn't know how to react or were surprised at all of these women they knew who had faced some form of violence um, in different levels in different um, spaces. And a lot of the conversation um, I saw, a reaction from men I saw included um, saying things like, oh, who are these people? Like, how do men behave like this? And things like that. And it just really, it was disappointing, I would have to say the word was. Like, I I went into depression um, at some point um, once after the Me Too campaign started because it's been years. A lot of these men are men who've been part of campaigns that we've been running, stories that we've been sharing, which are all based on real women's stories. Um, and these are stories to us when we hear women being violated. There's no surprise to it. We know this happens because like almost no woman we know ourselves have not faced a form of violence, especially perpetrated by a man on them. So when you know that we are being this vocal about it. We are being, we are talking about it for years at this point. And then men who've been around us say, oh my God, I'm so surprised. How did this happen? Where are these men? Who could these men be? And I'm like, these are the men who are around you. What makes you think that they're some rare species out there that you don't know? Um, so I wrote a piece about that, that these are the men around us and we keep on talking about them. Um, but apparently only it, it seems like it's a conversation only women are paying attention to. Um, and and then a year later, um, the same newspaper actually asked me to look back and write something about how I've, I felt things moved. Um, and at that point already this um, how I can change hashtag had sort of started. And I don't think it actually took off at all um, globally, I think, as well. Um, so I sort of wrote about that and how even after the Me Too uh, movement, even after such a global, strong voice of women talking about abuse, it still felt like men were not listening. Um, yeah. so I think compared to 27, 2018, 2017, 2018, today, um, I don't know, maybe it's a different age group, which is paying better attention to some extent. I feel like, like, I do feel like when I meet younger, um, people, younger men who are more interested to talk and understand, um, so maybe it's 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 a generational change that has come about. Uh, maybe it would still be difficult to talk to those same men who I felt weren't listening earlier. Maybe they're still not listening. Um, but generationally, I do feel there's a change. There's an interest um, in terms of, I think, people in their 20s, even for us, like 15, um, 20 years ago, I don't think our peers were as interested or considered these to be issues to talk about. So in that sense, I do think there's been a change. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the mass 
population, um, definitely not the mass population of Bangladesh. So there is um, a lot to have these conversations. And there's so much anti-messaging to these messages that are always out there because, I mean, our religions have a different language, a different form of what respect for women looks like and what respect um, or or power that men should hold looks like. Um, so it's not, it's definitely not the mass that we are talking about when we're saying there's been changes. But, but I do think with different generations, there has been more space, more interest. And that's just not just the urban population. I do feel that even when, we, when I go to rural areas for researchers and things like that, I do think younger men have a better openness to try and understand what these means. Their relationships with women around them is also different for with their mothers is different than what their fathers had with their mothers. So I think that 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 kind of change has come about. Um, but it's it's a long way to what would actually make things be different. So Tasafi, do you face any backlash for the work that you do? Is is it ever political in nature? Has religion been a factor that has perhaps been the reason for any backlash? Or is it social cultural issues? Or, you know, just, you know, there's a lot that has been written about um, how freedom of expression has become very challenging in uh, Bangladesh. So tell us a little about that. Um, I have to say, personally, I haven't uh yet directly face backlash as such um but in general i think when you know both politically culturally um religiously there is um in a way surveillance happening um i think that itself creates some level of awareness um some level of self censorship um and i think that definitely plays a role um, in that sense, I think, like, you know, compared to 2010 and today in 2020, um, I think there is definitely a difference. If we were to do the vagina monologues, I think we would have um, thought about it um, quite differently if we were gonna, going to just start it out today. So you're saying it's, it's, it's tougher to do it in 2020 than it was in 2010 because I remember in, around that time for South Asian countries to have vagina monologues was a big deal even in, in India I remember being invited and it was it was a closed door event we couldn't talk about it openly of course it took a couple of years for it to become uh, normal in in you know in cities across India so are you saying that it was far easier to do it I think the, the discussion around it would have been would be very different if it started now, um, because probably social media has a different kind of outreach now than it did back then. Um, so you didn't necessarily think so much about um, what went on social media, who could record something and put it up like, you know, a lot of these technological, digital issues you didn't necessarily think about in 2010, which I think makes it very real today. Um, and those are issues that we do have to think about. So when we are um, working around sensitive issues, we do consider security as something, um, as one of the things to you know think about, to consider how and where we do an event. Um, we've worked around sexuality and queer um, sexuality issues, queer gender identity issues. Um, so when we have very specifically um, queer related subjects that we are talking about, if we are putting it up as a show or as a performance, we do have to consider um, definitely the per even the performer's um, security as an issue because you never know how something can be recorded and used, um, how someone can be pl placed into um, playing a role but still be taken out of context and um, be used to either harass that person um, and where we do have um, homosexuality as a crime still in a legal um, way, manner, then it does, st is, I mean, those are issues to consider when we are, you know, using someone's face to talk about um, sexuality or homosexuality. Um, so I think those are definite things which 
I think in 2020, given digital reach, given um, social media reach, um, the mass um, participation from many different um, groups and population of people from across the country on these platforms, it does, like security does become an issue in a different way that which it didn't um, 10 years ago, definitely. So, so I think even though we have not specifically personally faced any um, direct backlash, but it does, like the situation itself creates some level of awareness of thinking about security, thinking about um, what we're putting up, where we're putting it up, how secure the information would be, how secure the information we're collecting sometimes, because we do do online surveys around different topics, um, especially around sexuality. Online surveys has been a great way to try and understand people's experiences around it, about themselves, their understanding. Um, so it does matter a lot in terms of trying to think about what it would mean if a lot of these conversations go out into open spaces. Um, and even though we are trying to push the boundaries and trying to take these conversations out there, there's definitely step-by-step uh, step, um, and careful process that we go through to try and figure out how, how big and explosive do we take it or how slow we, slowly do we try to push the boundaries. Yeah. Could you uh, talk a little about the impact of COVID? You know, we've, we've, we're also going through a pandemic for the past year, and there have been a lot of reports on uh, backlash faced by the third gender in Bangladesh. So could you talk a little about that? How, how have activists and human rights organizations been dealing and coping when it comes to that particular area? Yes, so when we talk about the third gender for Bangladesh, it's largely um, people belonging to the Hijra identity and community group. Um, and even though it's largely within the urban spaces, but we do have different communities spread out around Bangladesh. Um, I know a few of the transgender um, activists who've specifically directly been trying to work with these groups. Um, especially in terms of fundraising, trying to ensure um, support to them, aid to them during, um, spe especially when we had full, strong lockdowns happening across the country. Um, largely because for a lot of these um, communities, their main source of income is actually to go out, uh, look for um, handouts, look for funds, try to raise funds on a regular basis. Um, that's their major source of income. So when um, a situation like lockdown happens, they are literally cut off even more. Um, and social safety net um, from the government does not necessarily reach um, a lot of these communities. Um, even with uh, only last year that they've been provided um, the allowance to identify themselves as third gender. Um, but the process we understand takes a while. Also, there's a lot of confusion about who exactly falls within this third gender category um, in terms of whether it's um, legally, the definition is not very clearly provided by the government, which creates confusion and misunderstanding, whether it's transgender people, only intersex people, um, so there's that that crisis in being able to identify yourself as third gender in the legal term and to be able to access um, safety nets or social security um, through those processes. So there has been quite a bit of difficulty um, for the, the communities um, spread across Bangladesh. Also, the other thing would be medical facilities. Uh, for a lot of um, transgender people who are going through or transitioning, um, their medical requirements um, actually faced a lot of hassle during this period. Um, a lot of them also depend on um, going to Kolkata or India, other parts of India, for regular treatments for these. So t with travel being off, it was also another uh, big problem. Um, and I think a lot of them um, suffered quite a bit because of this. 
Um, I know um, some who were personally quite affected and, you know, it's not just a physical transition. It's a lot of mental process for them. It's a, it's a huge mental upheaval to be within this process and then in a way to be cut off from going through the trans- transitional process. Um, and I think that, that's, that these are quite long-term effects which are difficult for us to um, just expect would not have um, longer consequences. But I think in terms of mental health, even in terms of medical uh, processes that they're going through, for a lot of them, this has been um, something that they've saved up, saved up for a long time and to have to kind of discontinue in the middle of a process um, probably affects them in many various ways. So I think it's, it's, it's been quite a difficult um, period this year for a lot of the people. Okay, uh, Nasafi, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's uh, we, unfortunately we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to wrap up right now. But thank you so much for coming on the Sanya Paruki show. It was wonderful having you on, and thank you for the conversation and good luck with uh, your work and everything that you're doing. And I hope to, you know, that we will catch up again sometime. <laughs> Uh, but um, and thank you to all of you who have joined in and thank you for watching the show I hope that you will subscribe to the Sanya Faruqi show on YouTube follow us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram I'll see you again next week